Noi abbiamo in questi giorni una conferenza sui problemi che riguardano le neuroscienze, i comportamenti sociali delle neuroscienze e in particolare il prossimo intervento sarà un intervento che riguarda eh, diciamo, il problema del razzismo e come questo può essere studiato dalle neuroscienze. Non solo abbiamo una presenza eccezionale come quella del Ministro, abbiamo naturalmente le autorità, quindi ringrazio il Sindaco per la sua presenza e tutte le altre personalità che hanno, sono volute intervenire, sia ovviamente personalità politiche che accademiche e naturalmente ringrazio anche lo speaker che abbiamo oggi, eh, Dr. Elisabeth Febs, eh, continuerò brevemente in italiano, poi magari dirò qualcosa in inglese, eh, eh, il dottor Febs è un illustre studioso americano, eh, americana che ha studiato e ha conseguito il PhD alla Princeton University, è eh, diventata giovanissima professore universitario presso la NYU, l'Università di New York, ha ricevuto moltissime onificenze e riconoscimenti accademici, è membro dell'American Academy of Arts of Science e è presidente dell'Association for Psychological Science. Si occupa principalmente di neuroscienze cognitive, cognitive delle emozioni, apprendimento e memoria. E una delle prime che si è occupata delle basi neuroscientifiche della razza, che sono anche l'argomento del, eh, del seminario eh, diciamo, che oggi presenterà. E quindi, visto che i tempi sono molto stretti, eh, we are honored of having today Dr. Phelps, Who, uh, well, I described in Italian all your titles uh, and your studies, or few studies, so I will not repeat them, but uh, we are really happy that you are here to speak about this uh, very important subject for your presentation. Thank you very much. In the U.S., uh, over the last century or so, The, the endorsement of negative race attitudes, and particularly anti-black attitudes, has dropped dramatically. But over the last century or so, there's been this um, marked decrease in the endorsement of negative attitudes. In spite of this uh, strong endorsement of egalitarian views as a society, there is evidence that race bias persists. So I'm just going to give you a couple of quick examples. This is from our legal system. So if you're in the United States uh, and you're a black male, you're six times more likely to be in prison than a white male. Um, if you uh, commit a crime, the likelihood of jail time is higher for you for an equivalent crime uh, compared to an equivalent crime that a white male commits. Uh, Hispanic and black males receive longer sentences um, than white males for equivalent crimes. Uh, and interestingly, Inmates with more Afrocentric fe features, more typically African American, whether you're white or black, um, tends to receive harsher sentences than those with less Afrocentric features. And this is just, uh, as in the United States, as you know, we have a death penalty. This is just the likelihood of receiving the death penalty for crimes of different severities, so these being of medium severity. So this is the increase in likelihood of receiving the death penalty for crimes if you're a black defendant uh, versus a white defendant. So there's abundant evidence, in spite of our egalitarian goals, that unintended race bias influences legal decisions. How do we make sense of the fact that our beliefs and our, uh, that, that, that there's a difference between our beliefs and our perceptions and our actions? And I want to give you an example from another realm of psychology, which is perception psychology. So I just, uh, I'm just going to ask you, uh, is the table on the left or the right longer? Who says left? Anybody say right? Anybody? All right. Um, I'm just going to show you a little video here. For this, I will turn off the sound. All right, so I think, you know, so now you know, right, the table on the right and the left are the same width and the same length. Um, and now that you know that, how many of you still think the table on the left looks longer? 
Anybody? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, you know, our, the fact that, and the reason why we think this is, is, you know, through perceptual learning, we learn how to have, we learn about depth perceptions, the cues that tell us about depth. And that type of learning, you know, can, can bias us, can make us, uh, can make us uh, think things that aren't necessarily true. So learning affects our perception even when we're not aware of its influence. And when we are aware of its influence, it's, it can be awfully hard to overcome. And then I'm going to ask, can we take advantage of our understanding of the neural circuitry of implicit race bias to enhance our understanding of race interactions? And finally, I'm going to talk spend a little bit of time, and I think this is really where we need to go in the field, is how we might change race bias in the brain and behavior. So now I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about how I got into studying the neural basis of a, implicit race attitudes. Um, and I got into it because my primary job is to study emotional learning. And as I mentioned to you already, implicit, the implicit race attitudes we think are linked to um, the affective, the emotional associations that we learn through social learning, through stereotypes. So I was doing research on emotional learning in the brain. Um, and the primary brain region, and I should say the primary emotion I study is fear. Uh, and the region of the brain that we study most, those of us who study fear, is called the amygdala. So the amygdala is here in red. And this is sort of the front of the brain, the back of the brain, the bottom, the top. Uh, it's got its name for the world word for almond, which you can kind of see here. Um, and the slides I'm going to show you today, this is a human, uh, a human MRI image, and here's the amygdala here. So most of the slides I show you today, you'll see something like this. Uh, the amygdala we know from lots and lots of research in other species is important for very simple associative fear learning. So, uh, so we mimic these paradigms in humans. So this is very simple associative le learning of fear, much in the way Pavlov described. You simply pair something with something of significance, and now that neutral thing acquires the property of the emotional uh, the, the significant event. So the way we do this in humans, we do fear learning, or we call it fear conditioning, classical conditioning. The way we do it is I present a simple stimulus like a blue square, which doesn't really elicit an emotional response in most people. I hope not, at least. Um, I pair it with a mild shock to the wrist, and we let people tell us themselves if it's you know, uncomfortable but not painful. So it's really a mild shock. After a few pairings, the blue square itself will elicit a range of responses consistent with fear. These are things like things related to the fight or flight response, autonomic nervous <coughs> system arousal. So the one I'm going to talk about is called the skin conductance response. It's an indication of sweating that is consistent with arousal. So when we do this, um, given that we know from, from other species the amygdala is very important in this type of simple learning, Here's a, here's a study, it's a, it's a functional magnetic resonance imaging study. Here we're looking at brain activity. We measure something called the blood oxygenation level dependent signal. This is not relevant to you, but it's kind of the plumbing of the brain. It follows neuronal activity, so we think it's an indication of where the brain is more active. So if I show you a blue square that's been paired with shock versus a yellow square that's never been paired with shock, I see more activity in the amygdala, as I would expect. If we look at patients with amygdala damage, so I want to walk you through this. Here's a patient with, with an amygdala. I'm not a patient. Here's a, a healthy person with an amygdala. Um, here's the shock. You see this, this increase in skin conductance of arousal to the shock itself when you get a shock. You also then see this in, in, increase in arousal when they see the blue square that means they might get a shock. A patient with damage to the amygdala will still show an arousal response when they get a shock, but they'll fail to show this arousal response to the stimulus that means they might get a shock. So this tells us, tells us perhaps not surprisingly, that like uh, other animals, the human amygdala is necessary for this physical or indirect expression of a learned adversity response and fear conditioning. Here's the woman whose data I just showed you. I want to play for you what she said, because we she, we showed her her data uh, and asked her to comment. Let me just play for you what he, she said. I notice if there's anything odd about how to react to normal lifestyle, life threats, life fear element seems to be, to me, in my head, normal. I've never noticed anything odd. And, uh, I don't know. 
So I think as she dramatically demonstrates, in spite of the fact that her body is not telling me that she's learned this emotional response, she has very good knowledge of it. And this, to me, was quite reminiscent of what we see with attitudes, right? If I ask you to express uh, what your attitude is, you will tell me, you know, you have egalitarian attitudes. Yet, if I measure in another way through your responses, I might not see the same thing. So this, uh, so, uh, there was a, I had a colleague down the hall at the time I was at Yale University um, who was studying implicit ex explicit attitudes. Her name is Mazarin Banaji. Now she's at Harvard University. So this led us to ask the question, does the amygdala play a role in the implicit expression of race bias? Um, so to do this, we did this study actually in the late 90s on Yale undergraduates. They were all uh, white Americans. We brought them into the laboratory. We put them into an MRI machine. We showed them pictures of black or white male faces. And while they're imaging, we just asked them to indicate was the face repeated or not. Um, afterwards, after imaging, we brought them out. We gave them a scale that measures their race attitudes, their explicit race attitudes, what they think about uh, uh, the equality towards blacks and whites. Uh, and then two measures that measured their implicit uh, expression of attitudes. One was the implicit association test, which I will show you in one second. And the second was something called, was a, a measure of emotion uh, called potentiated startle. So if I were to go like this, oh, I got some attention. Um, uh, some of you would have blinked when you are startled by something like a loud noise. You blink, we can put, we can put little electrodes on your eyes and measure how hard you blink. And you blink harder if you're in an anxious state. So for instance, if it's late at night and you're walking home and no one's around and you hear a loud noise, you're gonna blink harder than if you're feeling more safe. So we showed them the black and white faces, played loud noise, startled them and looked at, did they startle more when looking at a black or a white face? Um, so I'm gonna show you now the implicit association test and how it works, uh, just so you get a sense, because I will talk about this a lot. This is the primary measure used in psychological research to measure implicit race attitudes. I'm gonna ask, all the students from the summer school to raise your hand. You seem very shy all of a sudden. I don't know, you weren't so shy before. Um, all right, so I'm gonna ask them to participate in this test. So, nobody else has to, but you're welcome to if you want to. I'm gonna time you. Um, so the way this task works, you're going to see coming up in this order a series of stimuli, it's either gonna be a black face or a white face, or a word that means something good, or a word that means something bad. And just so you know, the stimuli are going to come up faster than you can respond, but I want you to follow them in order as we go along and make your response. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to put your hands on your thighs, and I want you to tap your right thigh if it's a good word. Or a, word that, or, or, or a black face, and the left thigh if it's a bad word uh, or a white face. Okay, so I want you to do this as quickly as you can, but you have to process each stimuli as it comes on, and they're gonna come faster than you can respond, so just go all the way to the very end. Okay, and I'm gonna time you. <laughs> so is everybody ready? Yep. Yep, okay, here we go. Class participation is not good. <laughs> yeah, you guys. 
You didn't, you didn't really do it, did you? <laughs> All right. All right, I'm going to make you do the next one. So we, we do a number of trials like that, and, um, and then, we, then we switch the, the, the pairings. So you do a series of trials where now the, uh, the, the uh, black face is paired with, some, with, with a word that's bad. You make that same response, or you pair the white face with words that mean something good. Uh, and what you find, um, not that I can demonstrate with our students here, um, what you find in most Caucasian white Americans is that it takes them longer to respond when you pair uh, uh, black with good and white with bad than the opposite. And this is just our 14 subjects showing that effect. So here's the response time in, in milliseconds. Here's black paired with good, white with bad. Here's black paired with bad, white with good. Um, for, for black Americans, it's actually, as, an, as a group, they show no difference. They show no bias. But there's much more variability. So some individuals will show a pro-black bias. Some individuals show a pro-white bias. Uh, some will, know, will show no bias. Um, and again, I should also point out there's a lot of variability in white individuals well. But as a group, they tend to show evidence of bias with this differential reaction time measure. Um, so we found what lots of other studies have found, that there was evidence of implicit bias with this reaction time task. Uh, and also, people would startle more to the black faces uh, when they were watching the black faces relative to the white faces. We then looked to see how these responses of implicit measures of race attitude related to activity in the amygdala. Uh, and here's our three measures. So here's uh, our measure of amygdala activity. And what we see, there's a robust correlation between those white Americans who showed stronger implicit bias as measured with the IET, showed stronger amygdala activation. Those who showed stronger differential startle eye blink to black versus white faces, so larger amygdala activation. And there was no correlation with what they said, how they reported the, the race attitudes on the modern racism scale, our explicit measure of race attitudes. Um, and here's just, I've just now shown you the same correlations, but in the brains with the amygdala activation. So this tells us that amygdala activation correlates with the strength of implicit race bias, consistent with this idea that this brain region may play a role in the indirect expression of evaluative or emotional responses. So um, I said, mentioned to you earlier that, um, that these, these biases are expressed without our conscious effort or control, perhaps. And so uh, a student who worked on the original paper asked the question, do you need consciousness to express these attitudes? Do you need to be consciously aware of seeing uh, the faces? And so he did an experiment where he presented faces either subliminally, meaning so quickly that you couldn't actually perceive them, or superliminally, which means you could consciously perceive them. Um, and what he found was he replicated our results. He found activation of the amygdala to the black versus white faces. Um, he found it correlated with the implicit association test score. Um, but he also found that here is the unconscious superliminal, uh, subliminal faces. The, this is the white faces, this is the black faces, this is the, the, the uh, measure of amygdala response uh, using, the, uh, using fMRI, the, what we call the bold response. And here it is when you can see it. So actually, he found it both when you were unaware of the presentation of the black or white faces and also when you could see them. But the response diminished somewhat when you could actually see the faces, right? So then what, what did he see increase? So, so it seemed as if there was something that was driving this amygdala activity down, something that was, was inhibiting this amygdala activity. So two regions emerged that showed greater activity when you could actually see the faces versus when you couldn't. Uh, and that was this region called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate. Um, and I'm going to just tell you about those in one second. But what uh, another researcher, Jen Richardson, found was that Activity in these regions, how much activity is shown in these regions when viewing black versus white faces correlated with your, uh, with your, your IAT score, so your implicit race attitudes. Stronger implicit race attitudes, you see more activity in the anterior cingulate and the dorsal prefrontal cortex. Weaker race attitudes, you don't. So what do these regions do that could be influencing the amygdala? So we know a lot about these regions from other studies uh, in, in cognitive neuroscience. The anterior cingulate, we know, is a region that's very important in detecting conflict. Um, 
And uh, the, dorsal, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is a region that's important in the cognitive control of emotion. So what we think is going on is when you see somebody of another race and you might have an implicit response that perhaps is in conflict with your explicit attitudes or egalitarian goals, you may notice this conflict, and we think that's what, what this region might be doing, and then have, make some effort, so we think this is necessary for detecting the need to regulate your implicit attitude if you're in a social interaction, and that this region may play a role in regulating your implicit attitudes in a manner consistent with your explicit attitudes. So this took us to sort of a neural model of implicit attitudes, where you have a, a socially relevant stimulus uh, in the environment. The amygdala gets signals about the sort of affective response you have, and in this case, we think that's the affective response associated with cultural stereotypes. If it's inconsistent with your uh, explicit attitudes, the anterior cingulate detects the conflict uh, sends a signal to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex to mediate or to diminish uh, your implicit attitudes. So this suggests that at times we may unconsciously attempt to regulate the expression of our implicit attitudes to be in line with our egalitarian goals, uh, but obviously we do this with more or less success. Right? We, always, we aren't always good at it and we're not doing this intentionally. And I should point out there's lots of evidence that your motivation to be somebody that is non-biased can influence the engagement of this control circuitry. So I wanna now move on to the second part of my talk, which is to ask, can we take advantage of our understanding of the neural basis of implicit race bias to enhance our understanding of race interactions? So I'm gonna focus on two, uh, two types of social interactions. One is learning about others, and the other is making decisions about others. Uh, and so taking a lead from what we know what the amygdala does in other tasks, we're gonna now see how that science applies to the science of uh, social interaction of race. So I wanna give you first, this is from the fear learning world, which is sort of my home, um, one example. So I showed you an example here where I taught somebody how to uh, have a slight fear response to a blue square. Um, in the fear learning world, we know that some types of stimuli such as spiders, when you learn, when you have a negative encounter with them, you're likely to quickly f form a fear response that is now m difficult to get rid of even when you have other encounters that are negative. And it's thought that, you know, this is not true of every type of stimuli, so you don't have the same situation with butterflies. And it's thought that, that to be, this is thought to underlie why we get phobias to things like spiders and snakes and heights, but we don't get phobias to things like birds and butterflies. And I have a friend who has a phobia to mayonnaise. So I always use that example, it's very weird. Um, so uh, there's prepared fear learning, and the way this works, we, did, we tried to replicate this in the laboratory, the way this works is I take this stimulus here, it's just a picture, I pair it with a mild shock, I compare it to a stimulus never paired with mild shock, I take this stimulus here, I pair it with a mild shock, I compare it to a stimulus never paired with shock, um, and after a few pairings, I stop presenting the shock altogether. So now you should learn this thing is not dangerous and the fear response should go away. And this is what you see. All right, so here is, this is the difference in the arousal response to the stimulus paired with shock and the same category of stimulus not paired with shock. And we see a greater skin cut response to stimulus paired with shock. That's just simple learning. But now I stop presenting the shock right here and the fear doesn't really go away if it was the fear-relevant stimulus, if it was in this class of stimuli we called prepared. And it's been argued that through evolution, we're biologically prepared to develop stronger fear responses to certain stimuli um, because they may pose a more natural threat. And that's why these fears don't go away to the same degree. What's interesting about uh, these prepared stimuli is they're one of the few other types of stimuli that show amygdala activity when you present them unconsciously. Most stimuli won't. So this led us to ask the question, do other race faces look like prepared stimuli if you were now try to, to learn something negative about the other race face? So we did a study just like the one I just described, identical. Now, one of these was paired with shock, 
and this was the baseline face, never paired with shock. One of these was paired with shock, and this was the baseline face, never paired with shock. And here's what we found. So again, comparing it to its own baseline, we see stronger fear acquisition when you are learning to fear a racial outgroup member. And it's harder for that response to go away now that I have new information, this stimulus is safe. So in this particular experiment, we use both black and white participants, an equal number. So here I'm breaking down the data for the black uh, participants and the white participants. And you can see this effect as an outgroup race fit race uh, face effect. effect. It's a, it's, you see the same uh, pattern with the black subjects and the white subjects. You might argue that here the effect is smaller, relatively smaller, uh, for the black subjects and the white subjects. But actually, we also measured a number of things like their implicit attitudes, how many, what percentage of their acquaintances were other race, have they ever dated outside their race. Um, and all of these correlated with this effect. And in fact, if you dated outside your race, and that was a larger proportion of our black participants and whites, this effect just completely went away. Um, and so here is, I've taken out the subjects with no history of interracial dating, um, and you see it's an equally strong effect for both black and white participants. So why do we get this effect? So this tells us, we think, um, that there is a preparedness to associate negative outcomes without group members. And these negative associations may be harder to change with new information. Now, if we think about, if we, if we believe this story that we are biologically prepared to form these more persistent negative associations with stimuli that were, say, natural threats in the environment, it doesn't make any sense that this effect would be due to the actual race. Because we did not evolve in multiracial groups. We evolved in single racial groups. Um, however, we did evolve in groups, social groups, um, you know, different tribes, things like that. And somebody who's not of your group, however that's defined in the, in the situation that you are, may be more of a natural threat to you than somebody who is in your group. So we really think this effect is not due to race per se, but it has to do with how the local culture defines what is your in-group and what is your out-group. And of course, dating somebody outside your race might, might be a, a very powerful way to change your in-group or out-group. Um, and so this suggests as contact with others may alter our perception of in-group and uh, mediate this effect. Um, so what about decisions about others? So, um, so again, link, from going from what we know about the amygdala and other types of tasks, uh, we know that amygdala activation is related to both the expression of implicit race bias and decision and trust judgments of trustworthiness. You show more amygdala activation if you find somebody not trustworthy. So we ask the question, is race bias predictive of economic decisions to trust? So participants were given a series of, of questions like this. How much would you like to share with this person? And the person they saw was either uh, black, white, or another race. Um, and there was always a new individual every time they were asked this question. And you could, you could, cho you could share nothing to $10. And you were sharing them because you were playing a game with them. You were sharing with this person money with them called the trust game. And this is a standard economic, behavioral economic game. So the way this works, you see an individual. He's your partner. You have $10. You can make a choice. You can keep your $10. So now you have $10. Your partner has nothing. You can share some portion of your $10. Whatever portion you share is quadrupled. And your partner, let's say you shared $7, would get $28. And now you have $3. Your partner has $28. You can keep. Uh, your partner has a choice now. Your partner has $28. They can keep it, in which case your trust was violated. Your partner has $28. You have $3. Or your partner can share the winnings with you in which case you have $14 and your partner, uh, $17 and your partner has 14. So we ask the question, how often do you trust and how much do you invest in people of other races? Uh, and this is, we've, we, we had a multiracial group here. So here is our implicit bias scores here. Um, and we had a, uh, and so it goes from pro-white bias to pro-black bias. Um, and here is the number of offers they made 
of different amounts from 0 to 10. Here's a, and here's whether their partner was black or white. And here's an individual with slight pro-black bias. And you can see they share slightly more money with the black uh, partners. Here's an individual with a pro-white bias. They share more money with the white partners. So the higher the pro-white bias, the more you invest with white partners relative to black partners. What about uh, decisions about the cause of behavior? This is very important in a legal decision. Why did somebody do something? Did they do something because they were in a situation that caused them to do it? Did they do something because they're a bad person? We call this, in, in psychology, we call this attribution. So here's an attribution. Here's an individual who's driving. He cuts somebody off. Why did he cut somebody off? Because he's rude. What if I told you his wife is pregnant, he's trying to get to the hospital? Then you wouldn't say he was rude, right? You'd say the situation caused him to, do, to, do, to engage in this behavior that we think is somewhat antisocial. So we have the behavior. Our natural tendency is to assume when someone acts, they do it because that's who they are. So the first, it's pretty much our first instinct to say, oh, they're rude. We call that, uh, we call that a, a dispositional attribution. This is called the fundamental attribution error. As human beings, we generally underestimate the, the role of the situation in causing our behaviors. Um, so we overweigh the dispositional explanations for behaviors. However, if we get new information and we care to, so now you know he was rushed for a very good reason, you can control this tendency and you can make what we call a situational attribution. He's not rude. It was a bad situation. So we gave, uh, asked people to make these attributions for black and white individuals. Uh, and the, the, the behaviors we're asking them to attribute to either their disposition or the situation were either positive behaviors or negative behaviors. So for instance, here's Tom. You know that Tom left the, hurry, the restaurant in a hurry without tipping the waitress. I don't know about here, but that's really horrible in the United States. They'll chase you down the street and try to get that tip from you. Um, I don't think it's as bad here. Um, so, so then you find out that Tom's baby was screaming. And then you're asked, what was this behavior caused by? Was Tom really rude and, and cheap? That would be dispositional. Or did he do that because he was worried about his baby? That would be situational. So this is what we found. So here are attributions for positive and negative behaviors. Whether you're making an attribution about a black individual in blue or a white individual in red, for positive behaviors, it doesn't matter so much. But for the negative behaviors, you're much more likely to say that it was due to this person's uh, disposition than, their, than, than the situation. So you make, tend to make, and, this, and the, the tendency to do this, to say, this is because this person's a rude person, uh, if you're black, is correlated with your implicit bias. So in other words, the stronger the implicit race bias, the stronger the attribution bias for negative actions. Uh, in this case, if you have a strong pro-white bias, you say the black person is more likely due to who they are, was the white person is more likely due to the situation. And so you can imagine, if we trust people of other races, we have strong pro-white bias, and we trust people of other races more uh, differently, and then we attribute their cause of their behavior more often, if it's a negative behavior, uh, to their disposition if they're black and our, and our bias is pro-white. You can imagine that also will feed into the types of judgments we make, make in the legal system, because um, those are the things we weigh. You know, did this person intend to do this? Is it because of who they are? Was it the situation? Um, and do you trust that this person will, will recommit a crime? So we did the, a study just like that. I'm not going to go into the details, but we showed them an actual court case, actually gave them video and everything, changed the race of the defendant, and found what you would expect based on the statistics I gave you at the beginning of the talk. You're more likely to give a, this is the IIT score, this is pro-white, this is pro-black. You're more likely to give a longer sentence to a black defendant uh, if you have a stronger pro-white bias than a, black, than a white defendant. So what I suggested to you uh, in this section of the talk is that our decisions to trust and our attributions about the cause of negative behaviors 
are influenced by implicit race attitudes. Um, and again, these implicit race attitudes may, we may have very good intentions, uh, yet our implicit race attitudes may still be expressed. So I want to now get to the um, last part of the, part of the talk which is how might we change race bias in the brain and behavior? And here, I, I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm going to end with just a promissory note, not a good answer. But I'm going to tell you the kinds of things we're doing to date. Um, so I'm going to just briefly talk about four different techniques that we know uh, have some effect on the expression of implicit race attitudes. One is through experience with others. One is how you approach the situation. One is social context. And the last is awareness of implicit bias. So I showed you this experiment earlier where I showed, I showed uh, white Yale undergraduates, unfamiliar others in the scanner, measured their implicit race bias, showed that it was related to uh, amygdala activation. We did a second study with familiar others. Everybody know these people? These are old pictures because this was done in the 90s. Um, I think we had O.J. Simpson, but that was before the murder trial. Um, so we had familiar others. And when we had familiar others in this case, we found no consistent pattern of amygdala response and no correlation between amygdala response and race bias. So this tells us that familiarity and experience with others uh, that we know well can change the expression of these attitudes. Um, oops, this slide was supposed to be taken out. What about our approach to a situation? So this is a study by Susan Fisk uh, and Betsy Wheeler. They showed people black and white faces in an MRI scanner. They asked them to make either a judgment about that person's social group. So are we categorizing people by their group? It wasn't necessarily race, but any social group, like are they older or younger? Or they asked a question about this individual. Does this individual like celery? Kind of a silly question, but it's just about their, that individual's traits. And what we find is implicit race bias is stronger when you, you prime people to think about group membership and not as strong when you think about individual preferences, when you're actually looking at the person as an individual. And this is not, this is a different angle of the brain. They cut the brain this way. Uh, but here they see amygdala activation to the black versus white faces when you're categorizing by group, but not when you're focusing on the individual and that individual person's preference. So how you approach a situation, the goal that you have in that situation, can change uh, your implicit bias. The social context. So here, this is a study where they just simply did the standard IIT test that I demonstrated to you earlier, but the experimenter was black or white. Um, and what you see here, here is uh, responding, uh, here's the, the, respo the response difference between black paired with good and white with bad, uh, and the opposite when um, the experimenter was white, and that difference diminishes when the experimenter was black. We also see this effect in jury decisions. So this is a study by Somers. Um, they had a, a, a mock trial with a black defendant. The jury who was supposed to weigh this person's guilt or innocence was either all white or the jury had two black members of six. And we see whites in diverse groups. So here's the likelihood of a guilty vote prior to deliberation. Blacks in diverse group have the, less, the, the smallest likelihood of saying this person's guilty. Whites in diverse group is a little higher than that. Whites in all white group have a much higher tendency to say you know, that this person's guilty. So finally, the last thing I'm going to mention, uh, which I think is probably the most powerful way uh, to, to change implicit attitudes, is to start with just aware, awareness that they exist. Um, and most of us don't like to imagine that, that that table isn't longer or not. Like We like to think that what we perceive is exactly what is, uh, and how we interpret things uh, the first time is exactly the way they should be interpreted. Interpreted, But when we know that we can have implicit race attitudes simply because of our cultural upbringing, simply because of what we've learned uh, you know, through our experiences in life, even if that's counter to our, uh, to our beliefs and our intentions, uh, having that awareness gives you a leg up 
and now trying to fight implicit attitudes. And so I've, I've suggested to you earlier we may unconsciously engage a neural circuitry that can control the uh, unintended implicit bias, uh, at least as it's expressed in the amygdala, you know, if we have goals to be egalitarian, but we do this with mixed success because we're not really trying to do it. Sometimes we notice the, the discrepancy between what our beliefs are, but we do that unconsciously. Um, we can do this consciously. This is a circuitry we use all the time when we make conscious efforts to con control unwanted affective response responses. And so the main thing we're studying in my laboratory now is how can we consciously engage this neuro neural circuitry to more effectively diminish the unwanted impact of implicit attitudes on behavior. So this last part of the talk, I suggested to you that familiarity and contact, how you approach a situation, the social context, and our awareness of implicit bias may mediate the impact of race bias on behavior. Uh, and what I hope you, you take away from this today is this understanding that by combining psychological and neuroscience approaches to the study of race attitudes, we may be able, to be able to develop better techniques to diminish the unintended consequences of our implicit race attitudes on behavior. And hopefully, uh, if we have goals as a society to be egalitarian, we are going to be able to better align our goals uh, with our actions. So I just want to thank CISA for a wonderful few days, and of course, uh, primarily Rafael for doing a fantastic job with this summer school. I think it's really uh, a really great education experience for these folks. I've enjoyed being here. I need to thank all the people that helped with this research, and particularly Mazarin Banaji, who's my collaborator on all this work. And then I need to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. Grazie per questa eh, importantissima e stimolante lezione che sicuramente eh, potrà dare una mano anche ad aiutarci ad orientare l'approccio verso le politiche che facciamo. Eh, devo ringraziare l'invito, eh, devo ringraziare la SISA per questo invito a partecipare a, questo, eh, a questa lezione magistrale. Eh, un saluto e anche un ringraziamento proprio alla città di di Trieste, ma alla professoressa Rumiati che eh, so che si è impegnata molto per, questo, per la mia presenza qui e alla professoressa Phelps per la lezione e a tutte le autorità, dalla prefettura al sindaco, eh, alla mia collega eh, Tamara Blazzina per essere rimasta qui eh, a a sentire questa importantissima lezione. Quindi i ringraziamenti sono veramente uh, dovuti anche agli studenti che oggi pomeriggio mi hanno accompagnato facendomi capire e partecipare a quelle che possono essere le problematiche del, uh, dei ricercatori e dei dottoranti qua al, in questo centro. Io credo che questa lezione uh, per me uh, ha potuto dare una cioè mi ha potuto dare una luce, magari anche del, eh, degli elementi che possono rafforzare quello che eh, in questi mesi ho cercato un po' di far passare, di far capire. Eh, conoscere l'altro, la conoscenza dell'altro, rafforzare le diversità, eh, cercare di far passare la paura. E questo viene rafforzato un po' anche dagli elementi che ci ha fatto vedere la professoressa. La conoscenza, la familiarità del, dell'altro ci aiuta a combattere il razzismo, ci aiuta a conoscere meglio anche l'ambiente in cui viviamo, ehm, a mettere a confronto eh, le culture per dire che una buona convivenza comincia da qui. Eh, eliminare la paura, conoscere l'altro, ma soprattutto le diversità. Sapere che le diversità ci arricchiscono e uh, sono contenta che anche da alcuni uh, elementi della scienza questa può essere rafforzata ma ci aiutano anche a ad orientare uh, le scelte che possiamo fare nella società orientare l'educazione uh, nei giovani uh, orientare quelle che possono essere anche le scelte scolastiche capire che per uh, cercare di conoscere meglio l'altro conoscere meglio le altre culture bisogna iniziare sui banchi della scuola 
bisogna anche rafforzare quelle che sono le nostre politiche nel campo dell'insegnamento. Eh, eh, e quindi veramente grazie per questa opportunità e uh, spero di poter, uh, di poter utilizzare questi preziosi contributi per uh, il mio percorso. Ancora grazie. Noi ovviamente speriamo che il Ministro ci faccia nuovamente visita, eh, il tempo nel programma siamo molto in ritardo e quindi adesso ci sono degli incontri che il Ministro deve avere di nuovo nel, nella Sissa, quindi ringrazio ovviamente tutte le persone che sono intervenute, le autorità, le autorità accademiche, gli studenti, eh, i docenti, il personale tecnico amministrativo e questa lezione credo che sia stata molto importante per tutti per capire dei meccanismi che portiamo implicitamente dentro di noi. Eh, quindi grazie, ringraziamo in particolare lo speaker con la tua wonderful presentation che è really very important for us because I learned a lot of things that I was not aware of. So thank you very much indeed.